Good afternoon. I am Jeremy Labbé, Senior Policy Analyst uh, in charge of IPI Humanitarian Affairs Program, and I am very pleased to welcome today um, David Gressley, United Nations Regional Humanitarian Coordinator uh, for the Sahel. This event today is the second of a new IPI series offering a platform for humanitarian coordinators and other senior humanitarian practitioners to meet with the UN and diplomatic community in New York. This initiative aims to provide first-hand information to members of the UN community on, on the reality of a faraway humanitarian crisis and, by extension, to debate with seasoned practitioners, such as Mr. Gracely, uh, on some of the greatest challenges to humanitarian action today. The inaugural, the inaugural event to this series, held on September 11, 2012, featured Mr. Michael Keating, humanitarian coordinator for Afghanistan. It is therefore with great pleasure that we welcome today David Gressley, who will discuss the deepening crisis in the Sahel and its humanitarian consequences. As you all know very well, the Sahel is in the, in the midst of a serious crisis that combines several complicated aspects. Widespread and chronic food insecurity that affects up to 18.7 million people in the region, according to UN, uh, United Nations estimates. Recent flooding linked to above than average rainfall. Growing risk of desert locust infestation, all of which is compounded by a volatile security situation, especially in northern Mali, but also in northern Nigeria, due to the presence of the Boko Haram sect. The, the situation in northern Mali is in and by itself a source of humanitarian concern, as it has led to the displacement of 450,000 people, both inside and outside Mali, and it constrains the delivery of humanitarian aid. And undoubtedly, uh, David Gressley will address uh, the situation in that country. Mr. Gressley, who covers nine countries in the region, will describe the, hum the multiple humanitarian challenges facing the states and populations in this region, as well as the competing priorities to alleviate the crisis. From very short-term emergency relief to longer-term interventions aimed at strengthening the resilience of local communities to cope with chronic food insecurity. Mr. Gressley brings to this position extensive experience in the humanitarian field and with the United Nations. Prior to being appointed to his current role in April 2012, Mr. Gressley was UNICEF's regional director in West and Central Africa in charge of UNICEF's operation in 24 countries of the region, a position that you held for a relatively short time before becoming, coming um, to your current assignment. And before that, he spent approximately or exactly seven years in Sudan from 2004 to 2011, where he served in different positions, including that of deputy resident and humanitarian coordinator for Southern Sudan. To be more uh, precise, you actually spent seven years in southern Sudan, in Juba, right? Six years, 11 months. Six years, 11 months. <laughs> <laughs> to be precise. <laughs> Mr. Gressley, whose full biography is included in your papers, started his career as Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya and stayed with the U.S. Peace Corps for a number of years, a life dedicated indeed to humanitarian work. Now, without any further delay, I would like to pass the floor to David for a 15 to 20 minute presentation about the Sahel before opening the floor to, to our audience for a Q&A session. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be with, uh, with you today, all of you here today. Uh, what, what I would like to do uh, in this is, is to describe uh, the three crises that I, I think best that describes the situation in the Sahel. Uh, but first I'll describe which countries we're really referring to. Uh, as Jeremy mentioned, the, 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 that there are nine countries. The countries we're looking at for humanitarian purposes are Mauritania, Senegal, Gambia. Includes also Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, uh, Chad, and then the northern Sahelian states of Nigeria and the northern Sahel region of Cameroon for a total of nine countries. And in terms of the crises, I th the number one, what's really triggered, even including my own appointment to this, was the, the drought of uh, last year, 
uh, which led to a, a significant shortfall of production and, and, the, and the beginning of rises of prices of commodities uh, throughout the, the Sahel. Uh, so this was an acute crisis of food and, and, and malnutrition uh, that was across all of these countries. So that was the first crisis. The second is actually an ongoing one, which, is, uh, which was mentioned uh, earlier, is the chronic nature of insecurity. The acute crisis is affecting 18 million people in terms of food insecurity. It affects, uh, we project, uh, over a million children will suffer from severe acute malnutrition, which has a very high mortality rate, uh, just to give you a description of what we expected this year. But even in a good year, a quarter of a million children will die of malnutrition in the Sahel. So that's a good year. Uh, same is true on food insecurity. That remains, maybe not as, as much as we see this year, but there can, remains continued problems of food insecurity. So there's two medium to long-term crises here. One is dealing with the uh, underlying structural nature that causes continued food insecurity and malnutrition. And secondly is uh, building up uh, a resilience to that so that uh, households can absorb not only the chronic nature of the problem but also the acute one. Droughts are frequent. This drought was the third drought since 2005. These households have been hit repeatedly and therefore uh, are, are in a difficult position to recover. The third crisis is really the what, what also was referred to earlier, the crisis in Mali, the political security crisis, the fall of uh, the three regions of the north to armed groups, which caused the uh, outflow of a large number of IDPs and refugees approaching 400,000 people, uh, combined with uh, difficult access in the north, and I'll speak about that later, and the potential for a military intervention and, and uh, expanded conflict in that area are, are, is actually the third crisis that I would like to talk about today. So it's this combination of acute, uh, uh, slow onset uh, type of uh, uh, problem with the drought, the longer term structural crisis that exists there, and then the growing uh, security issues, particularly in Mali, but not limited to Mali, certainly in the north of Nigeria and other parts of the Sahel have been affected as well. Uh, and then just a quick moment to speak about my own personal role. Normally a regional humanitarian coordinator is not, uh, is not really uh, um, a standard feature of the UN system or the humanitarian system. Uh, this was, uh, my, my position was established mainly to focus on, uh, on, on five things. And I'd just like to describe that before I get into more details. Number one is to build up the humanitarian teams across the Sahel. Only in Niger and Chad were there existing humanitarian teams, and therefore there was a need to very quickly scale up uh, uh, capacity on the ground, whether with UN agencies, NGOs, OCHA, uh, 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 across the board in seven countries. Secondly, mobilizing the resources and advocacy. Uh, for the Sahel for 2012, we needed to mobilize $1.6 billion. It's a considerable amount of resources required both for the refugee crisis as well as the food and security, but also an advocacy uh, part of that, which is advocacy for resilience, advocacy for the emerging security issues in, in, in Mali, uh, and actually advocating for political solutions to that so as not to exacerbate the existing humanitarian problems. Third, a real focus on, on regional accountability of the humanitarian response, performance monitoring in particular, but other aspects of accountability were, were a part of that. Uh, number four was access, particularly into northern Mali, uh, but other areas of the Sahel where insecurity is a problem was also uh, an issue of concern. And finally, how to build a framework for resilience and a bridge for resilience uh, with the humanitarian and development communities to once and for all deal with the structural problems of food insecurity and malnutrition in the Sahel. So that's in globe, global what uh, I was asked to focus on and given a mandate of six months to figure all that out. So um, working very hard on that. Now where, where do we stand uh, in each of these crises? Uh, on the acute crisis, I think we actually have some good news. Um, I, I know, I know the, the, the title of, the, of today's presentation is a deepening crisis. In many ways that's true. But on the acute side, we actually have some good news. 
uh, number one, I think many of the governments in the region did a very good job of, 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 of uh, making an early call for action based upon the drought of last year and, and the initial assessments that indicated there would be a, a shortfall of food. Secondly, I think uh, many donors, uh, particularly the European Union, uh, uh, the U.S. government, and, and also OCHA put in significant funding through the SURF mechanism, did a very good job of getting money out earlier, which allowed a, a more rapid response. And I think as we come to the end of the lean season uh, this, this month, we're in a reasonably good position. Uh, I, I think basically the acute crisis has been contained. I mentioned the figure of one million children which we still believe will be the total uh, being affected by severe acute malnutrition. As of the end of July, over half a million of those had already, children had already been treated. Uh, and likewise, on the food side, uh, support to over four million people in that same, uh, that same month ending in July. So I think, in, in general, that crisis has been contained. And secondly, the prospects for 2013 look reasonably good. Uh, in terms of harvest. Uh, the rains have been good. Uh, actually, they've been above normal in many places, and if you travel around the Sahel, it looks green. Uh, but, and there's always a but, um, there is a threat of, a potential threat of locusts uh, that has not yet materialized, but they're still there that could cause problems. The flooding, a significant uh, short-term problem, uh, killing at least 400 people. Uh, it was also an issue, and that will have some impact on production. But my guess is the overall production level will probably meet at least the average or, or more, and we see the trend line in prices going down. So I think the Q crisis has been, has, been, has been contained, and I think there's some lessons that we can learn about how an earlier call to action and an earlier uh, response can make the difference on, on the ground. The problem we face now with, with a good prospect for 2013 is, the, is, the, is my fear that everybody will go home and say, okay, this is under control, but the chronic issue will still be there. And just as a reminder, uh, I, I said in a good year, a quarter of a million children will die of malnutrition. With the good harvest of this year, if we actually see that, a quarter of a million children will still die next year uh, of malnutrition in the Sahel. So we can't leave that second crisis. We need to focus on, 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 uh, on, on putting in place systems that allow us to deal with the chronic nature of the problem. Number one, we will want to work to rebuild those households that have been hit repeatedly since 2005 in terms of their livelihoods, particularly in the agriculture and livestock areas. Uh, we will want to continue to provide support to those children who will still be threatened with severe acute malnutrition. Uh, we will still want to provide support to those households that are food insecure. In other words, continue to support the outcome of this chronic problem. Uh, we will want to continue to build uh, uh, systems of disaster risk reduction and continue to re reinforce early warning systems with national governments and regional institutions. But the humanitarian uh, action is not enough. Uh, the kind of humanitarian crises we see across the Sahel are typically due either to a development of failure or a political failure or a combination of the, of the two. Uh, and we have to start attacking the development uh, uh, problem, the development failure. We need to start focusing on those households that remain vulnerable to drought, who remain vulnerable to a rise in commodity prices, uh, and, and target them directly with, with real support that will in, enhance their resilience in the face of future drought, where there will be another drought in the Sahel. That I can tell you. I just can't tell you which year. It could be 2016, 2017. It will come. And we need to do the work between now and then to reduce the impact. And also to reduce the $1.6 billion that was required to deal with the situation this year. We have an opportunity through a regular investment of resources today to reduce the impact, both in terms of human suffering and in financial costs to respond, if we take a resilience approach 
And I believe there is a window of opportunity to do that today. I have never seen the kind of coalition coming, it's still coming, but coming together uh, in this. National governments, regional institutions, major donors, the UN system, uh, other partners on the ground, including civil society and NGOs, are all very uh, interested in this right now. What's important is to see in 2013 an actual op making this actually operational on the ground. That means serious money needs to come uh, into into the Sahel to start working on the development uh, issues targeting these households, as I as I mentioned before. I think the will is there, the opportunity is there. Uh, the test will come as we get into 2013 to see if this partnership will finally coalesce and, and, and put uh, together the resources and the political will to deliver on resilience to attack the, the, the chronic nature of the problem. The humanitarian community will continue to do the support I just described, but that will, only, that will not be sufficient. It will require this kind of development approach if we're to succeed. On the third crisis, uh, Mali, uh, here it's hard to be, to be uh, uh, optimistic. I was reasonably optimistic on the first one. I think the second one is doable in terms of resilience uh, with Mali and, and its implications. I think uh, we have some difficult days ahead. Uh, and, and, and in many ways, my personal feeling is that the greatest threat to a resilience uh, agenda, a resilience approach across the Sahel is the kind of insecurity that we see in Mali, and particularly in the north of Mali today. So we cannot operate in the absence of either uh, appropriate development response or a political response uh, to find solutions for this kind of insecurity. I'm not here to, to promote a particular approach, but I, all I can say is that there has to be uh, uh, a, a successful political solution found. The consequence of, of, what we've, of, of the conflict so far in the north of Mali, and it's actually not an active conflict, uh, the Malian army essentially dissolved uh, in the early part of this year, uh, and these armed groups have, have moved in and taken over the major cities. Uh, basically, two major groups at this point control um, the three regions of the north, uh, which would be Ansardine and, and Mujau. Um, uh, this has created not only the displacement that I, that I described before, but it's created a political situation that is still evolving on the ground, both in the north and in the south. There is a need to secure the political transition in Bamako, uh, uh, which has been often called for. Uh, there is a need uh, to find a, a, a political solution to the north um, uh, that's inclusive of the communities of the north, uh, there is a need to provide balanced humanitarian assistance to both the North and the South. What's, what's often forgotten when we talk about Mali is that 80% of the humanitarian needs, despite what has happened in the North, actually are, 80% uh, of the needs are actually in the South of the country because that's where the bulk of the population is. So there's a need to have a balanced approach to, uh, to, uh, to, our, pro to our humanitarian assistance there. Um, we have been reasonably well funded on the acute crisis. The one, uh, when I talk about the 1.6 billion, 1.3 is for the food security and, uh, and nutrition activities, reasonably well funded. Uh, but on the refugee side, very uh, poorly funded. Uh, and our, and, and we're, we're, we're seeing the impact today. UNHCR is only able to provide life-saving support. Uh, they're not able to provide education support at this time. Uh, for me, this 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 is a, a worrisome uh, problem. We've al we already have a, a a population of children who've missed one year of school, and they're about to miss their second year. If this issue is not addressed, not only do they lose good prospects for the future, but they also may be more susceptible to group to join the various groups that have formed uh, in and around in and inside the north of Mali, uh, which would not uh, which would not which we would very much not want to see either. The, the, as you know, there is the potential of a military intervention in the north of Mali. There are those who call for a political dialogue, but there's also those who call for military intervention. Um, I think what we're likely to see over the next few months is, uh, well, it would probably take a while to see a military intervention actually happen. Uh, I think we have to be aware that uh, one, that the, the, the uh, doing nothing probably has a humanitarian consequence. Uh, in, in the sense that um, 
things will likely not get any easier or better for the people concerned. Uh, doing something badly may have even greater impact on humanitarian needs and suffering of, of people. Uh, what's required is a, is a political approach that actually uh, avoids, avoids those two scenarios. Uh, I'm not going to once again talk about what that might be, but I can tell you it's re it's required. Um, the the I think it's also important to remember that the uh, the status quo, even if there is no uh, military uh, intervention, still could lead to greater conflict either between the groups in the north themselves or uh, between the north and the south. Inadvertent and in it unintended. Uh, conflict often happens, and we have to be aware of that possibility. For all these reasons, we're putting together a comprehensive regional contingency plan for Mali to look at the potential uh, impact for different scenarios, and we're preparing planning assumptions for that for 2013, and to put in place a uh, uh, capacity to respond to uh, a declining security situation in and around Mali. Um, I think. Uh, for 2013, what we will be looking at uh, in terms of the humanitarian response is rebuilding the livelihoods that I mentioned, working on the chronic issues of food uh, insecurity and nutrition, uh, disaster risk reduction and early warning systems, but we'll be particularly focused on Mali and its implications. Uh, we'll take the regional contingency plan to develop uh, the, an appropriate uh, response plan for 2013. And into this, we will, we will build in a system of accountability. Uh, I think that's stronger than what we see today, both in terms of assessments, projections of uh, humanitarian needs, in terms of performance and outcome um, monitoring. Uh, I think also we need to strengthen our financial tracking system, which has some holes in it. Uh, that's important in order to guide donors on how best to allocate resources, because we still see a misallocation, uh, a, a less than optimal, I should say, allocation of resources due to incomplete information as to requirements. So that's another piece that we need to work on. Uh, and then maybe last, because I think I need to close here, uh, is that there's, uh, as you know, a request to prepare an integrated strategy for the UN, which encompasses the political security, human rights development, and, and humanitarian components. Just to, to let everyone know that uh, this is an integrated strategy, not an integrated operations. Uh, the operations on the humanitarian side will remain independent and function independently. Uh, but there, there uh, will be uh, uh, a strategy that's put together that uh, takes into account each of these components uh, without being uh, directive or operational in, in nature. So given that I've used my 20 minutes, maybe I should stop there and give everybody an opportunity to, to ask questions and discuss this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, I think it's indeed very useful to look at the situation down the, in the entire region through the, the three layers that you proposed, this uh, acute crisis, this uh, uh, chronic food insecurity problem, and then the situation, the conflict-related crisis in, uh, in Mali. Uh, before opening the floor to, uh, to our audience, I would like to, to ask you one question about northern Mali and about humanitarian access. Uh, you described some of the, the challenges uh, that the humanitarian community faces in the region that the populations themselves are, are facing more importantly. Um, but what's the, concretely, what's the current capacity of the of humanitarian actors in the region to, to respond to, uh, to this crisis? Are they present on the ground in northern Mali? Are they able to deliver aid, to monitor the delivery of aid? Could you develop a bit more on, uh, on this aspect, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I, and this is a very important question that will probably uh, grow in importance over time. Uh, the north of Mali, the, the primary problem in operating in the north of Mali is not that there's active fighting, because there's really not. There's occasional confrontations. Um, it's not that everybody is uh, insecure traveling there, but it's very much related to the perceptions of who delivers assistance. Right now, Malian nationals, regardless of which organization they work for, seemingly are able to, to operate and do operate uh, to deliver humanitarian assistance, 
It can be local NGOs. It can be international NGOs. The International Red Cross is quite active there. Um, so there are channels to operate in the north. Uh, WFP is currently delivering food to about 170,000 people a month um, through the river, primarily through the river at this time. Uh, UNICEF is delivering a considerable amount of medical and nutritional su uh, supplies to different NGOs operating um, uh, in all three regions of the north. Others, uh, the Red Crescent of Algeria is operating, I know, in the north of Mali. Uh, other organizations are operating uh, uh, and seemingly able to do so. Um, so the key seems to be uh, the right kind of nationalities, particularly Malians, are quite acceptable, and, and, and some nationalities from the sub-region also seem to be able to work uh, un, un, generally unhindered. I'm not going to say that it's easy, because uh, it's not, but what we have seen since April is a growing humanitarian space, which I think is quite commendable, and I think we need to acknowledge the efforts, particularly of the of the NGOs, the Red Cross, and others who've worked to, to really uh, get that in place. Uh, I think it, it is quite commendable. Um, initial efforts to try to control distribution by different armed groups, which is now there's been some pushback on that, which worked. Uh, and generally, the distribution seems to be going OK. Um, I, I'm concerned about uh, monitoring this assistance and the possibility that it could be used either by these groups or by others uh, for whatever purpose. So far, uh, and this is anecdotal information since we don't have direct monitoring capability right now, uh, but from different sources, and these sources could range from IDPs to uh, refugees to uh, government officials who used to work in the north, who are from the north, that have contacts, UN officials uh, from the area, Malians, that is, who used to work there, still have contact. Basically, they all tell me the same, the same thing. Uh, because they can still communicate by phone, uh, they talk to, to families, colleagues, the assistance seems to be getting through by and large. Uh, we don't have large stockpiles of humanitarian assistance. Assistance generally goes directly to the communities and is distributed. So at that level, it works. Uh, what we don't have is a good global assessment of, of the humanitarian requirements. Uh, we have more anecdotal understanding of what's going on. So there is a process underway that I've asked the humanitarian coordinator to lead uh, during the month of October to try to carry out such an assessment so that we get a clear picture of the, of the, of the requirements on the humanitarian side. Secondly, the monitoring that, uh, that you mentioned is still a question mark. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, optimistic that the kind of system the way it's working now is necessarily going to, to last. And we need to develop good systems, and we want to adapt from Somalia and other countries where such systems have been put in place for remote uh, programming, uh, systems of risk management and remote uh, monitoring uh, that use their experience, and we'll try to replicate that in Mali. We've had initial work on that underway. So I think we'll overcome that as well. But I also think we have to understand that if, if there is a, a military intervention or uh, other conflict that emerges in the north, the kind of uh, prospects for what we see happening today in terms of humanitarian assistance could turn very rapidly, and we need to be prepared for that change should that happen. Thank you. Thanks, David. So I would like now to, to open the floor to, uh, to the audience. We have up to one hour of, uh, of discussion now. Um, Please, one uh, practical note before before starting with the Q&A session. Uh, since we are, we are webcasting this event, I would appreciate if uh, all of you could first make sure to hold the mi to wait for the microphone to come to you, uh, to speak in the microphone and hold it steady so that it is well uh, recorded. Um, and please just uh, give your name and affiliation before asking your question, please. Um, so I will start with uh, this lady on the on the front row. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for being here today. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Ann Phillips. I'm a member of the board of the IPI. Um, what about the responsibility of the governments? I mean, you mentioned all of the NGOs and, and different groups that are going in there, even different agencies from the UN. A little bit closer. Oh. All right. Is this better? Well, I'll introduce myself again. Ann Phillips. I'm on the board of IPI. 
Um, I'm interested to know about the role of the government. It seems to me that there should be some responsibility there and not a total dependence upon humanitarian intervention from agencies of the United Nations or other uh, development agencies. And is there some coordination between the government and these agencies? Um, and I'm interested also to know if there's a role for regional or organizations that exist. I mean, it seems to me if, if all of this is done for the region all the time and for the governments, there's not gonna develop any, any expertise or skill in doing it for themselves. And I'm not suggesting help shouldn't be given. David, in the absence of other question, I suggest that you, you take this one uh, directly. Was that a general question for the governments or one more specific to Mali in this case? No, no, Mali is more general. Okay. Mali is a very unique situation. The, uh, 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 if I gave you that impression, that's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, because that's, I think on, on, on the ground, many of the national governments have been very proactive this year. Number one, they were very honest, many of them, so at different times, but, but they were more honest in terms of, of the actual seriousness of, of the problem, which was already a major step forward, uh, which allowed uh, for early warning to be, to be effective. Uh, number two, many of them are now working on, on programs, particularly development programs, uh, on resilience uh, to try to address the longer-term problem. I think Niger is probably the best example. They have a 3N program, uh, which in English is uh, a Nigerians uh, feeding or taking care of Nigerians, which is a comprehensive program uh, looking at everything from productivity issues on agriculture to social safety nets and so forth. Um, and it's a very progressive approach, I think, in terms of, of what we've seen in the past. So I think we actually should be congratulating many of the governments there, both for the early warning and for starting to move actively in trying to find answers structurally to this. But they are constrained, and I think we have to be frank about this as well, the, the issues of insecurity, including it with the government of, of, of Niger, which has had to divert its own resources for self-defense because it sees the threat coming out of Mali as an existential threat. Uh, we have to understand that kind of dy dynamic as well. So I, I have to say, and I'm saying this very honestly, that the, the goodwill that we see there is probably better than we've seen, in, 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 certainly in my experience, in the region. And I think from that point of view, it's a very good opportunity and it's a very good time to see this kind of investment and partnership that I'm talking about. And this, of course, includes the regional institutions as well. Um, so I do see a level of activity that we've not seen before, a level of commitment that we've not seen before. So uh, I think in this case, some of your, your concerns are being addressed by these same governments. So I'm actually quite optimistic in that sense. But they will be stressed by all the things that we're seeing on the security side in the Sahel. We also have to take that into account. Thank you. So, and Philips, yes, if you, if you have an additional Do question on this. Do you play a role at all in educating the government agencies how to function? I mean, in terms of new agriculture techniques or development, uh, means of development, so forth. Do you instruct them too? Because I suspect that a lot of the, there's a learning curve there that needs to be developed. Well, no, I don't, I, I don't personally instruct, oh, I <laughs> but the UN system. We, we provide technical assistance, uh, uh, which is to provide good quality advice, and, and of course governments take that or not as they, as they, as they, see, as they see appropriate. Uh, but I think also they have their own, their own experience. I, I was in one country uh, where the Minister of Agriculture, and I thought very interestingly, what he did is in order to try to, to guide him in, in formulating uh, a, a, an agricultural strategy was to bring on board all the former ministers of agriculture, of whatever political party they were with or whatever, and brought them on board. And they, and they worked, he asked them to work together uh, and travel around the country to come back with the, what they thought were the key, uh, the key interventions that would make a difference for people on the ground. Um, and I think it's that local context as much as anything. And that's very helpful because then the technical assistance that comes in after that can be very well directed to what, what people locally feel is important to, to make a difference. So that's also happening on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I see one question there. Um, uh, Mary O'Reilly from IPA. 
Hi, David. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about organised crime on the ground in the Sahel. It's something that we've been hearing a lot about. I wonder if you could share your own experiences. What evidence have you seen and also how this could potentially impact the humani delivery of humanitarian aid? Thank you. If there is any other question, I might bundle this together. Otherwise, I will just, oh, I see one more question here on the left side. Hi, my name is Hilda Klemestal from the Norwegian Mission. Uh, thank you very, uh, for a very good presentation. Um, I have two questions. Uh, firstly, do you look uh, to other countries in Africa or the region to see uh, to learn from their experiences. I know Kenya, for instance, have done a lot to, to build their institutions and to build resilience in Kenya. And also, um, considering how many of the farmers in the region uh, are women, what's, do, you have a, do you have a gender perspective on your work? Thank you. So David, I get back to you with those two questions, yeah, one on right. transnational organized crime and the other one on experience from other regions. On, on the question of organized crime, that's a very, uh, very good question, uh, because I, I, I actually believe that that's one of the fundamental drivers of what we're seeing on the ground right now. Um, uh, there was, a, uh, I think, a report from, um, I think it was UNODC, that estimated that the dr net profit from the drug trade in 2011 in the region it was in the order of $900 million a year. And, and, and that's a lot of money, and that's the net profit. That's not uh, that's not gross. So uh, uh, you can do a lot of damage, quite frankly, with uh, that kind of money. Um, and 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 I think it's important in looking at at how things evolved uh, in in the north of Mali. Money made a difference in in who dominates in in, in the north. Drug trafficking is a component. Hostage taking is a component. Uh, hostage taking is worth tens of millions of dollars uh, in terms of additional resources. Uh, one thing I didn't say, uh, and, I, and I could have, uh, one of the reasons why we're, we're hearing, uh, when I ask the question, when I'm told that our, our, our assistance is not being diverted by these groups concerned, the usual response I get from people I ask that question is, is because they don't need it. They have adequate resources or more than adequate resources on their own, and they don't really need. It's not like the typical uh, um, uh, armed struggle where, where, where the, an armed group is struggling to get resources. This is not the case in the north of Mali. So that changes that dynamic as well. So organized crime, I think, is a, is a significant problem, and um, drug trafficking in particular. Uh, this is, I think, part of what contributed to the problem of, of uh, what we see in the north of Mali today. And, and as we all know, the links of this uh, can be quite far-reaching. So without going into a lot of detail, I, I will simply say that I think this is one of the major drivers of, of what we see there and has to be a part of the solution. Any, any conversation I've had in Mali talks about this. Uh, they see this as very much a part of the overall threat. The second question, uh, looking to other countries, um, uh, I, I'm not sure I can give you specific examples, but I do know that it happens, and uh, both within the region as well as outside the region. Uh, and many of the institutions on the ground that provide technical assistance also do that as well. So uh, uh, it is happening. Uh, and I think on the second part of the question, I think we're all very, very aware that uh, the, the important role that women play uh, uh, in, in communities, in agriculture production, and in other areas uh, so, yes, that's very much a part of our, our overall strategy. I didn't mention it, but one of the things that we did do this year was develop a, a, a framework for uh, resilience programming for our country offices, uh, country UN country teams in the region, and that was a central part of that, uh, uh, of that strategy. Thank you. Yes, this gentleman on the front row. Thank you very much. Patrick Hammer from the Mission of Luxembourg. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a, a couple of questions. I mean, you started, let's say, on a positive note when it comes to the acute crisis. You mentioned as well that within your role, you have an advocacy role. 
what would be you know the sort of main arguments that you would use and that uh, in order to convince the mobilization of the international community not only to work on the humanitarian side, which it has been responding quite well, as you were describing, but to carry on 2013 and beyond until the next drought to sort of mobilize consequent sufficient resources to support the various governments and the various plans that you've de described, like the triple N in Niger and the other price, uh, plans that have been developed by other countries? Because I, I believe this is sort of a fundamental question. I mean, you mentioned the resources that, you know, that uh, it might become cheaper and less human suffering, but, you know, these arguments, unfortunately, do not carry the same weight once CNN is away, to, to put it uh, that way. The second uh, question, you mentioned the integrated strategy which the UN will sort of uh, finalize. And one of the elements of the strategy, which was as well announced by the Secretary General, is the nomination of a special envoy for the Sahel. In your eyes, what could such a special envoy do? I mean, what would be his uh, main role and uh, how would he sort of... Uh, be able to sort of tackle these three, these various crises that you mentioned uh, in an effective way. Thank you. David, yeah, I will give you the floor since with these two questions you have quite a lot on your plate and then I, I took note of uh, those who want to ask additional questions. We'll go back to the, the floor after. Yeah, on the first question, I have found that I get the most traction on, on what you're talking about in terms of advocacy. When, when, I, when I tell people that even in a good year, a quarter of a million children will die of malnutrition, that actually sinks in. People who are not specialists in, in, in humanitarian or, or development or, or specialists in the Sahel, when they hear that number, a quarter million children dying in a good year, they realize, yes, there is a deeper problem. And, uh, and then you can start to develop an argument from that. Um, so uh, there are ways to put it uh, such as that, that that I think makes it uh, real to people who are not familiar with the issue. And so I, I use that quite frequently. It works with journalists. It works with, uh, it works with uh, political uh, people. It works with uh, a variety of people. Children will die. Adults will suffer as well, but children will die, and that's the ultimate, uh, that's the ultimate problem. So I, I, I think we can, and I, and I don't have, you know, the people who, who manage the development assistance understand this. Uh, what's key is how those resources are used. We're not going to get lots of extra resources. I think we have to be f frank about that. So what we need to do is use those resources well. And we have to use them in a way that actually targets. And that's where the humanitarian community can play a, a very positive role, is to say this is where you really need to focus, because this, these are the communities that historically suffer the most, and these could benefit from this kind of development assistance. The humanitarian teams can, can help guide in that regard, and that's what I'm hoping will happen. And what we need to do then is build the partnership between the humanitarian side and the development side so that they have an ongoing conversation on this. Everybody talks about a paradigm shift. I don't like paradigm shifts so much because uh, it's, it's an overused phrase. But I, I, what I do think is important is there is conceptually a, a division between humanitarian action and development action. That, that concept tends to fade away as you get closer and closer to the ground and people on the ground see what's required. Um, and, I, and I think what we need is a sustained piece of work between the humanitarian side of the UN and its partners as well as the development side uh, to work on common programs that inform each other on how to deal with resilience. And that's what we're going to try to achieve this year in the nine, in the nine countries that I mentioned earlier. I think we can do it. So uh, there is a way to do that. And let me remind myself of your, oh, the special envoy. Uh, my, my, my first and primary response is you probably should ask the Secretary General rather than myself. Um, so all I will say is what, what he has said, which is that the special envoy is, um, is uh, um, uh, responsible for overseeing the development of the integrated uh, strategy and uh, will oversee um, uh, how it, it is implemented. As I said earlier, I think what's important uh, is the independence of operations on the humanitarian side, and that has not been, uh, that will not be affected by this appointment. Uh, so um, that's basically what I can say on that right now. Thank you. 
just before giving the, the floor back to the audience, I'd like just to build on the, the last question raised by this uh, gentleman from the Luxembourg mission. And uh, on the, the issue of the, in the integrated strategy, um, do you see that as um, a cause for concern in the event of a military intervention in, uh, in Northern Mali, um, given that it might um, contribute to blurring uh, the lines between some humanitarian actors, political actors, military actors, in the, um, in the view of the, the armed groups that are there in Northern Mali on the field. So it's a matter of perception. Well, what are your thoughts on, the, on this? I'm not particularly worried about the integrated strategy having an impact on, on the perceptions that, that you talk about, the perception of, of potential belligerence in this, in this situation. Um, however, the military, uh, military intervention itself, I, I think that's a different story. And, and, and that's something that we will need to, to prepare for, is how, how to ensure the perception of independence and neutrality in the event of a military intervention. This is not peacekeeping, this is peace enforcement of some, of, of some nature, and that's quite, quite different. So this is a very real issue, but I'm more concerned in terms of the intervention itself. Now, we've already started working with ECOWAS and, and their humanitarian arm uh, on, on, on this kind of issue, and we've also worked internally in terms of how, uh, from an OCHA point of view, to, to, to work with uh, a potential mission that might be uh, put on the ground, which takes into account the concern over the perception. So that's already in place in terms of thinking. Um, uh, we can't do much more until an actual uh, decision and a force is actually generated, uh, but we have a, an approach to take that's already set out. Thanks. I'd like to give the floor to the lady on the third row in the middle. Please. Thank you uh, very much. My name is Nicola Reindorp, and I'm with Crisis Action. Um, thank you for the presentation, and also thank you to the colleague from Luxembourg raising the question of advocacy. Um, Crisis Action brings together coalitions of some of the world's largest humanitarian and human rights organizations trying to uh, force a change in policy in how governments protect people halt conflicts or warn of impending disaster. So of course my question is again about advocacy. Not so much about the arguments, but about the targets and the priorities. So I recognize very much that you have been very careful in what you will not say about political solutions. Um, and I recognize that that is a difficult question to ask. But if we think about Mali, I would like to push you to say where you think uh, advocacy efforts should be most targeted and of course to be as frank as you feel comfortable being and also in that line picking up on the points that have already been shared about this very painful um, and powerful complex of issues that are emerging in northern Mali of organized crime of hijacking of insecurity of um, Islamist groups of humanitarian crisis resilience and so on and so forth in a week where we've had the Secretary of State Clinton highlighting Mali as a cause for concern, where do you see advocacy efforts should be most focused in terms of paying, putting pressure or highlighting issues that are not being taken into account, where there is not yet sufficient understanding, where there are not yet the strategies to respond appropriately? Thank you. More specifically on Mali, I, I think number one is um, uh, I would certainly advocate and, and do for a clear understanding of the actual dynamics on the ground. Uh, and that's, that's a fairly straightforward thing to do, but it's not so easy for many uh, uh, who've not been closely involved with this to have a clear understanding of what those dynamics are. And there's a history, which is important. There's the current context. There's the complexities ranging for all the issues that you've described. Uh, there is how the current government in Bamako functions. Uh, once again, I won't state opinions on this, but what I will state is it's clear that if you're going to try to come up with a solution, and ideally a political solution, that avoids humanitarian consequences, all of that has to be clearly understood by those who are about to make decisions on how to intervene uh, in Mali. I think uh, there's a general agreement of where we would like to end up, but how to get there, 
um, will be best served with that understanding. So that's one thing I would certainly uh, I would certainly continue to push for. And it's part of what I do when I travel around. I talk about what I know. And uh, I'm, I usually try to be clear what I do know and what I don't know, uh, but encourage a deeper understanding by, by decision makers. Um, and number two, I think it's important to talk in the case of Mali of the likely humanitarian consequences of what might, uh, might be uh, uh, envisaged. Uh, and that we can, we can do and we'll be able to do better once this regional contingency is done. Uh, we'll have more concrete uh, numbers in terms of what we think the implications would be. So I think there are ways that we can we can advocate, and and of course there are things that one says in, in a forum like this that uh, you might. Uh, there are things that you say in other conversations. So it's uh, it's important. I think my, in terms of advocacy, what I've tried to do is number one push. My first agenda was to push the need for funding for the acute crisis. Number two strategy was to push the resilience and, and to see where we were coming on funding and trying to get an understanding on, on, on how this might come about and work with those who are in a position to, to influence how, how this could be ultimately structured. And, uh, and now number three is, as you say, Mali. And, and, and while I'm not involved on the political side, uh, my clear message is please understand the dynamics so as to minimize the unintended consequences of what might be done. So, if that works, yeah. Any other questions in the audience? Yes, um, Doug Marcado from the, the US Mission, you have the floor. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Just a quick question, you mentioned in Mali, uh, approximately 80% of the conflict-affected or drought-affected population is in the south with 20% remaining in the north. But can you give us a bit more information about the UN and its partners' access to the north? Uh, how good would you say your access is? And do you have a dialogue with the armed groups up there that will facilitate the delivery of adequate amounts of assistance in the north? Thank you. <coughs> Well, as I described before, there is uh, um, uh, the primary access is through those NGOs who've maintained uh, a presence on the ground, both international as well as local. Um, uh, that does not require a direct contact with the with the groups concerned in order to operate. It does not mean that they, as uh, as organizations, don't have um, uh, don't have encounters and so forth. That that does happen. Uh, but it's not as if you have to ask permission either, if, if, uh, if you understand the distinction I'm trying to make. Uh, basically, humanitarian assistance is allowed uh, without uh, significant interference on the ground at, at this point in time. Um, I'm not convinced that this will be always the case. Uh, uh, an armed intervention, I believe, would be one of those things that would change that very, very dramatically. I also think we need to play it relatively low key in terms of advertising of what we're, what, what we're doing. We do see that the symbols of the United Nations, whether it's WFP, UNICEF, and so forth, seem not to pose a problem in, in the circulation of humanitarian assistance. So I, 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 what I would say is I, I, we've discovered that there's much more space than we thought originally that might be there. Uh, and we see that there are ways to continue to expand that. Um, and, and so from my point of view now is how do we now get a, a, a much more uh, comprehensive global picture of the humanitarian requirements in the North. Um, as I said previously, we have bits of information from different locations, but it's not necessarily systematic in, in nature, and that we're working on. And more importantly is to start putting in place uh, systems based on lessons learned and other other similar environments, and I mentioned Somalia, and we are working with the Somalia office right now to see what, what systems can, we can replicate locally. They've been very helpful in that regard, and uh, we hope to bring on board uh, more people who will set up similar kinds of risk management and remote monitoring, monitoring kinds of operations, and that will continue to give us a better picture and understanding of what's going on. Okay. Any question in the audience, or should I build on uh, Douglas' question? Maybe I will. I will ask you a question then, um, David. On the on the well, in line with the the previous question about dialogue with armed groups, um, I mentioned in my introdu introductory remarks that um, this 
humanitarian affairs surveys is also an occasion to uh, touch upon some of the great challenges to humanitarian action today. One of them is the issue of the, the so-called criminalization of, uh, of humanitarian engagement, of dialogue with armed groups, uh, where such groups are designated as um, terrorist entities, being by the, within the UN system by the Security Council, or by the, by the US Department, by the, 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 the European Commission, and so on. Um, do you see this as a problem in the Sahel, in northern Mali in particular, given that, well, there is Al-Qaeda in the uh, Islamic Maghreb there. Um, Boko Haram maybe is, a, is an example. I'm not quite sure if they are listed. But, so do you see that as a problem for the UN, but maybe also for, for other humanitarian actors? The UN have uh, some uh, privileges and immunities. Uh, NGOs don't. So do you think it inhibits a humanitarian dialogue that is needed in order to have humanitarian access? In, in the case of the Sahel, for the moment, it's not a major impediment, but it, it could well become one at a certain point in time. In the case of Boko Haram, if I'm, my memory is correct, certain members of, of Boko Haram have been placed on, on, on by the U.S. government on a on terrorist list, but not the organization itself. Nonetheless, we still operate throughout the north of Nigeria uh, without having to work directly uh, with them. Uh, there's still sufficient government control, et cetera, to, to operate. I was actually, since you raised the issue, I'm going to move away from Mali for a moment. I, I actually traveled into northern Nigeria partly just to see how we were doing on the ground because, as you know, there have been many frequent uh, attacks, uh, bombings and so forth, particularly in the north. And I, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I, I had thought that there would be lots of reticence about doing work on the ground. Uh, but we have a lot of, in, in Kaduna, which was one of the locations I went to, we have 80 staff operating out of Kaduna. Um, and, and I traveled with our chief security advisor uh, in part just to try to answer questions that might come up on how, how best to, to, to work in such an environment. And, and, and what, it, what struck me was the attitude of the staff was, well, yeah, they wanted to talk about security a little bit. But after five, maybe 10 minutes at the most, they quickly moved away from that and started talking about their programmatic requirements and their, and their desire to get this and that done without, uh, without uh, really referring to any security impediments. So in effect, I found them much more proactive on the ground than I thought they might be given the, the level of insecurity that you see throughout northern Nigeria. Um, so I think that's a, that's a credit to those, to those individuals who, who, who did that. So in many of these, for the moment, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we can operate and are operating uh, either directly as a UN in the north of Nigeria or indirectly in the case of uh, the north of Mali uh, without having to have uh, a serious kind of negotiation uh, with these same groups. So it does not pose an immediate problem. But one could see over time that that situation might change and this issue could become a, a problem at that point. Thanks, David. So I, I will give the floor to Rowan Hug uh, from IPA. Uh, hi, uh, Warren Hug, IPI. David Gressley, thank you very much for coming here. Uh, it's particularly interesting for us because, as Jeremy said, this is the second in a series that he's been heading up in which we invite humanitarian coordinators to come to New York. We have another series here which has been going on for four years, which is called our SRSG series. And I wanted to ask you something uh, based on our experience there. We often uh, say about that series that it gives people from the ground an opportunity to come to the New York community, the UN community in New York, um, and, and, and tell us uh, what it's really like on the ground. And by way of doing that, to comment on how good or how bad the communication is between the field uh, and between headquarters. And so I just wanted to ask you a general question. Uh, are you getting the response of this? You said I was really intrigued, and I, by the way, am a former journalist. I was really intrigued by the, your saying that that astonishing number of, of dead children was a way you got people's attention. Um, uh, are you getting the attention from this community in New York that you think you need for your work uh, in the Sahel? Well, I think increasingly so. Uh, I'm actually um, uh, um, quite struck by the level of interest in the Sahel and Mali in particular, but, but the Sahel. Um, um, 
coming here. Um, I, I, you know, I've, I came here a couple of months ago as well. Um, there's a very strong interest, and I think there's a very, very much a learning curve because this has not been necessarily high on people's radar screen so far. But in the meetings I've had with our colleagues in different, uh, you know, organizations with the UN here and, and outside, there's usually a very good participation uh, by by every. Everybody seems to have a hunger for information right now, which goes back to the earlier point. Uh, which I think is positive, trying to understand what all these dynamics are, because from afar, it sometimes is confusing. You, um, and if if someone can give some some detail of explanation of why things are, are working the, the the way they are, it seems very much appreciated. So, but I do think we're still on a learning curve here, and and uh, but the interest certainly is there, and from that point of view, I'm, I'm satisfied with what I see uh, coming to New York. And we'll continue to work with them on uh, however we can, as I say, to try to ensure that uh, people have the right information to make the right kind of decisions. Thank you. If there is no other question from the audience, well, we might slowly get to, to the end of our meeting. Um, before that, and in order to maybe look a bit ahead of us, uh, I'd like to ask you a, a last question in relation to a really uh, recent um, activity across the street here in the, in the UN. Last week was um, this high-level summit, uh, high-level meeting on the Sahel on last Wednesday, from which um, a communique of the Secretary General um, was uh, was released. Uh, according to you, what are the uh, what are the, the takeaways of this meeting, looking ahead for the future of um, of the region in terms of uh, humanitarian concerns and for for humanitarian actors there. Well, yeah, and maybe I'll go beyond just that particular meeting as well, because I think there's there's more to it than that. I think, first of all, it signals the strong interest of the international community on the Sahel, which was certainly not there a few months ago. Uh, that's already, I think, a, a strong positive. Uh, the political commitment to appoint a special envoy, I think, is a, once again another strong commitment, uh, as well as the integrated strategy that's been mentioned. Um, I think all of this is, is useful in, in ensuring appropriate level of attention and resources coming in to deal with it. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, humanitarian action really is a consequence or a need because of a development failure or a political failure or a combination of the two, which is why I'm happy to see an integrated strategy that's trying to look at those things to try to deal with the structural issues that we see across the Sahel. I very much would like to see the role of a humanitarian coordinator uh, made uh, irrelevant, and, and uh, this is certainly a start in doing that. So I think all of these things are, are positive in, in terms of signaling the, the seriousness of the issue and a willingness to start working on it. And I think the hard part is to come, which is to actually organize this in a, in a coherent and, and informed way that will ultimately make a, a, a difference uh, on, on the ground, and I think it's still possible to do that. Um, uh, one thing I will say, which I have yet to say on the political side, um, w while not involved directly, as I keep repeating, I do hear on the ground in Mali, uh, where I've been frequently, a very much uh, a desire for good political dialogue with the different communities of the North. Uh, so that opening is still there. I'm not sure that it'll be there forever, so this is a very good opportunity, a very good time, a window that should be taken advantage of to see how to pull those communities together with that of the rest of uh, the country to try to deal with some of the long-standing problems. But there seems to be a strong desire to do so, and I think that's a very positive uh, environment in which to work. But these things don't always last, so we need to be quick. And my very last question. Uh, you, you say that uh, this position of regional humanitarian coordinator is quite an unusual feature uh, in the UN system, and it, it, it is indeed. Do you, do you know if your position, uh, regional humanitarian coordinator for the Sahel, is meant to last? And do you think uh, that it will exist for the years ahead? 
Well, my understanding is that it will likely continue into 2013 and be reviewed uh, as required uh, in terms of whether or not to continue the, the role. I think it will be continued only as long as it's relevant. Uh, the primary reason for it uh, this year was actually the food and nutrition crisis. It has evolved beyond that now, including the resilience and the issues of Mali. So I think the intent is through uh, 2013 that that's likely to continue. After that, I'm sure it will be reviewed again. Right. Well, thank you very much, David, for being here with us today. Uh, I hope not to see you in beyond 2014. Again, it would mean that the situation is maybe getting better and that you're not a regional humanitarian coordinator anymore. Uh, and thank you to, to our audience, to, to our, the participants to be here with us today. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.